This is a reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4b through 9 and 15 through 25. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land. The Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit. And also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm it and to take care of it. The Lord God commanded the human, eat your fill from all of the garden's trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you eat from it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all of the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. The human being said, This one is finally bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She will be called a woman because from a man she was taken. This is the reason that a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife, and they become one flesh. The two of them were naked, the man and his wife, but they weren't embarrassed. Here are spirit-filled words that invite us to wonder. Spirit, reveal yourself in them and through the words spoken there. Amen. So I was just thinking uh, how blessed we are uh, to have Pastor Megan and, of course, Pastor Veronica here during this season. He was, uh, it really touched me that... Uh, moment with those backpacks, a reminder to us that we are a part of a community, that we are a people gathered together to celebrate God. So I'm just very thankful that all of you are here on this homecoming Sunday, but also because our staff is here and I'm appreciative of them. So as many of you get back into the rhythm after a summer of being uh, home or vacations or the natural sort of slowdown that comes with the summer months, I want to officially welcome you back home to Epiphany. Of course, many of you haven't gone anywhere, and you have been here perhaps most of the Sundays of the summer, but you get what I mean, right? We begin the season now with new confirmation classes and confirmands and sort of the beginning of our more robust whole, our whole lives program around sexuality and dating and all those things for young people. And of course, the choir is back. The choir is back, which always makes me happy and uh, many others as happy as well. And then there's college football, which is the center of my universe through the fall. Um, I heard that pro pro football is back as well, though, to be honest, it's never really interested me much. I hear the Cubs will have a great season on the gridiron at at Soldier Field, Uh, though I heard they lost to the Green Bay Brewers on Thursday night, which is not a good thing. All right, bad, I know. Seriously, though, it's also a kind of a new preaching rhythm for us preachers in this congregation with the adoption of something called the narrative lectionary. It's a different way of of sort of approaching the scriptures that focus on the larger story of scripture. As someone who has uh, used the revised common lectionary uh, and used it for some 21 years, it's a chance to hear different texts and follow a more natural storytelling pattern. You'll hear over the next couple of years a lot more stories than perhaps you normally would have instead of more of the didactic texts. And so I'm kind of excited about that as well. Now, speaking of storytelling and natural beginnings, we begin the programming year with the narrative lectionary with the first story of the Bible, really the second story of creation found here in Genesis 2. 
Of course, there is a first story in Genesis 1 where God creates over six days and then eventually pronounces that each of these acts of creation is a good thing. Then God finally rests on the seventh day. Remember that these stories, of course, are not concerned with the science or, or human origins. They are not concerned with the how of creation. They are always trying to answer the question of who created the world and why God created the world. From the first creation, we then move to the second account of creation in Genesis 2, away from the sort of macro to the micro, right, to a more detailed understanding of the creation of humankind. In the first account of Genesis, in creation in Genesis 1, God creates Adam and Eve at once on the same day. But today in the second story of creation in Genesis 2, Adam is actually created first and Eve is created later. In the first creation story, the writers or writer speaks of the heaven and the earth. But here in the second story, the writer actually changes up the order and speaks of earth and sky instead of heaven and earth which signals that this creation story, oddly enough, will come from a more human point of view, us looking up rather than God looking down, as it was in the first creation story. And in today's text, unlike the earlier creation story, God will use the very breath of God, right? We'll actually use the very earth God has created as sort of the building blocks of humanity, the dust, the topsoil. The best soil. In fact, the word Hebrew word Adam, which means human, and Adama, which means fertile land in Hebrew, they sound very similar to each other. The writer of this ancient story knew that the soil, the dust, was literally the stuff of life. It was what allowed the vegetation to grow and food to be had. It was so important that it was the stuff of what humans are made of. The fact that the writer uses a term meaning topsoil, the best soil, that fact echoes the words from the first creation story in Genesis 1. Remember these words, and it was good. It was so very good, God says. We are humans. We are made of the good stuff, the very stuff of life itself. And so the story continues with this co-creation of man and woman found in the first story of creation in Genesis, sort of getting reworked into a different story in Genesis where man is created first with woman then quite literally being brought out of him, brought out of his body. The text says that Eve was built from one of Adam's ribs, though the Hebrew word around rib is a lot more ambiguous than you would think. But nonetheless, some part of Adam becomes the building block of what then becomes Eve. Now, there's a lot, of course, to unpack about all that, especially around its patriarchal assumptions, the idea that all things should and ought to flow through maleness, and that, in fact, a woman is just an extension of maleness. Of course, I don't think the patriarchal assumptions of the writer of the text are true. I want to make that clear. And we must acknowledge that these assumptions have caused women and the rest of humanity such pain because the patriarchy, the fundamental idea that men should rule over women, has called real and horrific damage to women and, if we're going to be honest, men, to us as well. And yet I don't think the patriarchal writer of this text is making a case for the divine cause of patriarchy, or at least that is not his immediate role. Now, I think he's noting something universal, something true that has been there almost since the beginning, and that is this problem of human loneliness and the deep despair that comes with feeling alone in this world. I mean, what does God see with this moment? Think about it. What does God see when God looks at Adam, at this first human creature? What God sees is a lonely figure, one without another, one without the other, and one who feels that loneliness, I think, deeply. The interesting thing is that God alone, interesting enough, God alone cannot meet Adam's loneliness. The divine, at least not in this moment, in that manifestation, cannot cure, so to speak, Adam's sense of loneliness. God is not enough here, at least not for Adam. And so God goes forth to solve the problem by creating Eve, by creating a creature just like him and yet different, not quite like him, another that is both recognizable but different. 
And of course, that is what we are all to each other in the end, if you think about it. We are the same, but we are different. You and I are the same. We are human. But what makes life less lonely is that I'm not looking into a mirror at myself and you, but at you, you know, at you who are different. And you are the one that dissolves my aloneness. Think about what the writer says here. God creates the other for Adam because God saw, after naming so much that was good day after day in Genesis 1, including the creature, the creation of this human creature, God saw something in this world that was not good, which was this solitary figure of Adam, all alone in the world, and even God could not cure that, that kind of loneliness. God could not be that other that dissolved Adam's loneliness. Now think about this for a second. After all that God pronounced as good throughout the first creation, and the second creation in this story tells us the first thing here, the first thing that God saw that was not good, and that was human loneliness, human aloneness. I think anyone who's been paying attention to our well-connected culture has noticed how, in fact, we have become interesting enough amidst all these connections. We have ironically enough, become incredibly disconnected from each other. Yes, we can communicate with each other in ways that are almost miraculous. I think nowadays, 30 years ago, I cannot imagine all the ways that we can remain connected to each other. But communication is not community. Communication with the other is not necessarily being known and knowing the other. I have 943 Facebook friends, simply because I've lived in a lot of places and I've served a church or two over the years. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that I and many others who have maybe robust Instagram feeds or large Twitter followers or whatever, it's not that we really actually have close friends. Studies have recently shown that in this age of technological connection, most of us actually, ironically enough, have fewer significant friends. Men, I think over 40, oftentimes cannot name a single close friend. And so we find ourselves feeling lonelier and lonelier. The recent spate of mass shootings among men seems to have a common pattern. They were, they were committed oftentimes by people who felt themselves to be profoundly alone, alone in their, their lives, alone in their particular suffering. And some then lashed out with adopting bigotry and hatred toward particular others, often, often hitting out against those that don't look like them or love like them. And they've used guns to eliminate those living reminders that, among other things, they were alone or felt themselves to be so. In the past, I've shared with you the work of Emmanuel Levinas, the great Jewish philosopher and theologian. But I think today it's worth noting, again, his powerful belief that the human face is the borrowed presence of God. And that the human face is where traces of divinity of God are ultimately to be found. Levinas was trained as a philosopher and less so at that time, a uh, uh, um, theologian in the Jewish tradition. And he survived World War II, ironically enough, not because he was actually not put in a concentration camp. He was serving as a prisoner of war uh, in a camp in uh, France. And so that probably saved his life. So after the war, he sought some way to find some universal ethic, right? I mean, here you have experienced the Holocaust, and you've seen your people experience the Holocaust, and he's trying to find some universal ethic that will help us make our way in this world, and ironically enough, he finds it in the human face. Levinas argued that it wasn't the sameness of human faces that should drive our ethics. That is, we shouldn't do the right thing because others uh, are all the same as us, that our commonalities shouldn't be the foundation of our ethics, that human sameness shouldn't be what compels us and me and you to be ethical and humane with each other. Instead, Levinas argues that it is actually the differences in those human faces that should invite us to do the right thing. And that the foundation of ethics is resisting the temptation, symbolically, of course, to kill and destroy and eliminate those, eliminate those who are not the same as us. We ought to resist the temptation, quite literally and symbolically, to kill what is different from us, to resist giving prior, priority to only our experience, only our understanding, and only the faces that look like our face, so to speak. So much of our attempt to meet our loneliness is sometimes to seek like-minded souls, but 
Levinas actually offers us a different route, a different path, one taken, I think, by God, when God created a different other in Eve from Adam, a different face, a different body, different from the one that Adam had. One doesn't need to take the story of these bodies and this story in Genesis 1 or 2 literally to see what God is asking us to do in the work of meeting human loneliness, our own and our others. The solution to human loneliness is not sameness, but difference, and our choice to embrace the differences found in others. God is not only found in the sameness of things, of people, but in their differences. Divinity is found in diversity, not uniformity. And the solution to human loneliness is not seeking someone who mirrors my story exactly, but who has another story to tell that enlarges my world, that reminds me that the difference between us make those moments that we do have of sameness, of connection, even more powerful. The root of bigotry and prejudice and anti-Semitism anti -Semitism and, and racism and, and homophobia and sexism even is this desire for sameness, a desire to dictate uniformity in the world, to make all things, all people the same, erase all the difference. That's what's going to make me not alone and not lonely. I just need to see others who are like me. We think that's the case. We humans ought to resist that demonic drive within us because the many different faces, different kinds of human faces and all their diversity, again, are, according to Levinas, and I think he is right, they are literally and symbolically the borrowed presence of God. And if that is true, then God is interested in variety and not similarity. Our desire for sameness is a misguided one and one that cannot ever really cure our sort of existential loneliness. Now think about this for a second. In this moment, God did not offer a mirror to Adam when she found Adam feeling so alone. In that moment, she created Eve, who was the same in so many ways and yet so different as well. We shouldn't expect to conquer loneliness in the world or in ourselves by choosing, ironically enough, to look in the mirror. You know, I've been continuing to sort of sift out the lessons I learned while I was on that sabbatical last summer. It's taken me a while, folks, or the summer before the one that we're about to finish in 2018. And, of course, a lot of the focus was, what does it mean to be the church now in the 21st century? What does it mean to be faithful to the gospel now? What's next for the church? In fact, today, if you notice, it's the first word of today's sermon title. And if you see it in future sermons over the fall and spring and winter, it will be likely my attempt to share some of that learning that I found in my sabbatical. One of the questions I've been thinking about is how the church, this church, the church universal, can be a place that can meet the staggering sense of loneliness so many of us carry with us. Our alienation from people around us, even from a culture we find ourselves immersed in. On the one hand, some cultures, some, excuse me, some churches have decided to do the opposite in many ways that we have done. They have decided to tighten up the boundaries of their communities. They're ever ready to cast out those who don't believe the same theologically or even politically. The solution they offer is not the diversity found and offered in Eve or the differences symbolically, symbolically found in human face. No, what they hope to achieve is sameness. And underneath that is this belief that if we are the same, we won't be lonely. If we are the same, we are together. Sameness as a solution to despair is, they, is what they offer. It's what really the fundamentalists offer. They're believers in every religion. We've all got to believe the same and look the same and wear the same thing. I mean, all of us fall into those traps sometimes, surrounding ourselves with like-minded friends. I certainly do, but the church has, of course, fallen into that trap often too much and with consequences that actually push people away from the living Christ rather than towards him. There is another way. There's a scarier route. And that is for us in the church to actually build spiritual spaces where differences are embraced, truly embraced, and that sameness within those communities, at least sameness all the time, should be something that actually alarms us. It's about trusting what God put before us in the second creation story, that our loneliness, all human loneliness, can be met and cured not by seeking someone like us, 
but someone different than us. The church has rarely taken that risk and instead chose the path that said that sameness means togetherness and togetherness automatically means a lack of loneliness, which of course is a lie. I would love to say that Epiphany, we at Epiphany are always an exemplar of that good work, of being a place where diversity is something prized and wanted, but of course we're not. Most of us probably generally agree on most things theologically or politically, and we can pretend that that doesn't make us comfortable in this place, like our culture in general. We in the church have actually accelerated what some sociologists call the great sorting the self-sorting of each other out by class and race and politics, by geography oftentimes, and we self-sort through theology. I mean, some of that is unavoidable, to be honest, but that doesn't mean that we should be comfortable with that reality, knowing now that we know of God's solution to Adam's loneliness, God's creation of someone who is both the same as Adam, but also profoundly other. Look, there are things to be proud of in this place. I am proud to be pastor at Epiphany. Things like our confirmation program, which is this authentic exploration of God and meaning and our faith and its commitment to making sure that our youth can ask hard questions and they don't get easy answers and make their own decisions about their faith journeys. That is something to be proud of. And I'm always reminded about that when I speak to other people about what they grew up and what kind of confirmation program, programs they had. Or the fact that some of us don't always agree with each other about who Christ is. You and I may not agree about who Jesus is and how to understand him. And there is a lot of room in this place for a diversity of opinion. But if we're going to be the church of the future and a church that meets what I think is one of the most pressing needs we humans in the West are struggling with, and that is human loneliness, and I think those mass shooters out there, those white, alienated men, deeply rooted in their misogyny and their bigotry and all that awful stuff, So much of that comes out of this sense of human loneliness. If we're going to meet that, we have to choose difference and not sameness. I was listening to a a podcast this week where the host was asked by a friend who happened to be going through depression about a recent book that the host had had read by Dalai Lama on the topic of happiness. And before the host could reply, the friend said, you know, the one who was depressed said, look, I just don't want you to tell me that the path to happiness is like through helping other people, okay? And of course, the host just laughs because of course that is exactly what the Dalai Lama wrote, right? You want a way through depression? You want a way through human loneliness? engage the world, engage other human beings. It seems so simple and yet it is the hardest thing if if you've ever been depressed, right? But the way through loneliness to happiness, at least towards inner peace, I don't think the Bible actually ever ever promises happiness. God actually promises us peace, not happiness. And that's a different thing. And the way towards that is always through other people. God could not meet the loneliness of Adam. Eve had to be there. If that is true, then the church and our church has to embrace a way of being the people of God that recognizes the borrowed presence, uh, the face of God and the faces of those who we do not, that do not look like our own, that do not, do not look like our own. And so I'm going to ask you to do something the ministers don't usually ask you to do when it comes to inviting a friend to church. Because I think that's always a great, one of the things that uh, somebody remind me this week, this would be a Sunday we invite folks to come to church, the choir's back, we're more full force than we have been uh, throughout the summer. And it's a great thing. It's a great strategy, right? I'm going to ask you to do something. You know, it's a good thing to ask someone to church who you think, listen, I think, Susan, you would be a great match for Epiphany because it sounds like you share some of our same values, that this is a place where you want to seek God and be sought by God and where you can say and say the hard things and believe some of the things and sometimes feel like that's not what I believe. That's a good thing. But I want to say this. Instead of always asking someone you think would be perfect for Epiphany, ask someone to visit Epiphany that you think would be a challenging fit for this place. Not only for them, but for us. If we're going to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that really is the church of the future. A place built not on agreement about God and politics and everything else that divides us, but one that has willing to see the presence of God in our differences and what Eve saw in Adam and Adam saw in Eve. 
Now that's a church I want to belong to. How about you? Amen. Friends, join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for uh, the sameness and the differences. And we ask for the courage not to seek our happiness, our inward peace, through always looking for people that have lived the same stories we have, that tell the same stories we have, that believe the same things that we do. To have the courage to find you in those who tell different stories and speak of different experiences. And in that moment, those moments of connection that do happen can be enriched and we can see your face, your beautiful face in others. In Christ's name we pray, amen.